Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Randall Wolf. I'm here at Houston Methodist Hospital, DeBakey, CV Live, another installment of CV Live. We've had some really interesting discussions about atrial fibrillation, and I always try to top the last one. I think maybe we will. Uh, I've got a very interesting presentation for you today, and I've invited a guest to be with me. Uh, we had a little bit of audio problem. Because of uh, COVID, we had to move the studio here temporarily, but I think we're up and running uh, now. So this, for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to talk to Mr. McCasel, uh, who has a very interesting AFib story. And maybe the best thing to do is just uh, start from the beginning. Uh, welcome to the program. Introduce yourself and uh, tell us your story. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Steve McCastle. I'm currently 45 years old, and I am a survivor of atrial fibrillation. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2018, almost exactly two years ago, and about six months ago, um, I know I, I got rid of it by uh, the host of this show, Dr. Wolf, through a procedure that he has pioneered called the Wolf Mini Maze. So, but Steve, let's go back. And uh, I think people are always interested in hearing uh, a story because a lot of people who listen to this have AFib also. And you've been yeah. through the ringer. And I mean it. You've got quite a story. So uh, go into a little detail of uh, what happened before you came to see me. Yeah, well, um, I can probably track this back to about, I would say, 2012, when I first started experiencing the palpitations. I started, mm -hmm. as I'm laying down at night, I can start to feel my heart beating irregularly. It's not steady. Skipping beats, it would pause for a couple of seconds, then it would beat rapidly. Uh, and I knew something was wrong, but I was involved in, in, in business, I was involved in some high level negotiations, a lot of stress. So I figured that that was my physical response to the stress I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I developed, I guess, a bad habit of just kind of putting my head down and just bearing down and, and pushing through it. And I started to associate that feeling of, it was almost like a nervousness, but it was a, you know, your heart's racing, uh, your, your, your body temperature gets up. I started to associate that with the intensity of my business dealings. And 2012 turned into 2013, 14, 15, and I never got it treated. Would, um, a lot of well, Steve, would this happen, happen quite frequently? Or would it happen weekly? At first, it would happen, I would say, almost weekly, probably every couple of weeks at first for the first year or so. And then it started to happen weekly and then bi-weekly and then it ended up turning into almost every night. I can almost count on it. As soon as I go to lay down, that's when I start to feel it the most. During the day, if I kept myself busy and I just kept pushing through it and doing a bunch of things, I didn't really feel it. But as time went on, it started to really drain my energy. I started to just mysteriously become become weak. I was weightlifting every now and again. I was doing things that were physical, and I just noticed that I was getting out of breath. I was getting winded. I would sweat, um, and I felt sick. But I had obligations, you know, obligations to my company, obligations to my family, obligations to my friends. So many things were depending on me that, like I said, I just put my head down and just pushed through it. Probably the wrong thing. But I think what ended up happening was my AFib got worse and worse and worse. It started to happen, like I said, almost every night. And then in 2017, when I moved to Texas, by the way, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, involved in the rat race, high pace, fast, high energy. So I moved to Texas for a slower pace, thinking that maybe it's less stress. Maybe, you know, this would reverse itself. Um, and I was taking a lot of natural supplements like uh, uh, CoQ10, magnesium, 
these types of things, but nothing nothing worked. So 2017, I moved to Texas, and it was almost exactly a year after I had been in Texas. Um, Can we take questions? My heart started to, it escalated to another level. So <clears throat> I, I, I would just be, I would be sitting here. There's nothing I could do to escape it. You see, before I moved to Texas, I could always just do, do other things and take my mind off of it and just deal with it at night. But it had gotten so bad that throughout the day, it didn't matter what I was doing, my chest was just pounding, and it was not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like when you run, heart's beating fast and hard but steady. It was the, the irregularities that were really bothering me. So to make, this, make the story, to bring it into what actually happened, <clears throat> I was telling my wife, I said, all right, look. I think there's a problem. I'm going to give it one more night. If it doesn't get better, I'm going to have to go into the hospital. And I said that at about noon on Mother's Day, which was almost, you know, two years ago, May 13th, also my dad's birthday. Mm -hmm. So it was Mother's Day, about noon on a Sunday. And uh, I said, if it doesn't get better, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go into the hospital. So I decided to, I said, I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to lay down, see what happens. Well, it got worse and worse and worse to the point where I said, I can't wait another night. I think something might happen if I wait one more night. So I checked myself into a, a local, um, what are those called? Like an urgent care. Yeah. And as soon as I walked in, you know, they once once they got my pulse and they started listening with the stethoscope, uh, they made it very clear that something was wrong. You know, the nurse was like, "Oh, sweetie, what have you done to yourself? What's going on?" But it all of a sudden turned very serious, and they told me I needed to be, go to the hospital. So I said, "No problem. My truck's right outside." They said, "No, no, no. You can't drive. We have an ambulance coming for you." You know, and I was an uh, ambulance. I mean, I, I I could just drive to the to the hospital, you know, ambulance came and they gurned me out. Last thing I remember, I'm in the ambulance. I'm small talking with the EMT. They open the doors to their emergency room. I'm on the gurney. They're wheeling me in. That's the last thing that I actually remember. So you uh, you lose consciousness when you it, when you got the emergency room, just having been transferred from an urgent care center because your AFib was getting so bad. Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually just lose consciousness, I actually coded. I was, uh, my heart stopped, cardiac arrest. It was the first of two cardiac arrests that I had that day. Now remember, I'm 43 years old, in fairly decent shape, and um, I, I just didn't believe that it was that serious of a thing. I, don't, I was in denial or whatever, but I'm on the gurney, they're wheeling me into the emergency room. That's the last thing I remember. Immediately, I went into cardiac arrest. From what I'm hearing from my wife and from uh, other people telling me these, what happened, uh, they, you know, some, some uh, the, the cardiac response team was there. They immediately started to give me <clears throat> CPR. They broke my chest, they get on there and they you know, they, 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 they cracked my ribs and uh, were able to revive me after three minutes. And, of course, I don't remember any of this. At this point, I'm, I'm unconscious. But I'm not even sure if it was a, a coma or what, what you would call that. But I was unconscious, and they took me upstairs to another room. And uh, it happened again. Code blue. Uh, this time... The drama was ratcheted up a little bit because this one, at about the 15 minute mark, the doctors that were trying to revive me and I was unresponsive for 15 minutes, they actually came out to my wife and to my sister who were there and, uh, you know, gave them the bad news. They told, from what I'm hearing, the doctor told her, I'm sorry, he's not responsive. It's been 15 minutes. Uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very sorry. Pretty much, I was written off for dead. 
Yeah. So my wife. She wasn't you, take, she wasn't happy with that, was she? Uh, no, you you you've met her before, Doctor Wolf. Yeah. You know she's pretty spunky. Yeah. And. Um, she told she him to get like, back in there, didn't didn't she? She started arguing with him. No, you do not give up on my husband. That's my husband. She's screaming, making a big deal. You get back in there. So the doctor said, all right, we'll try one more time. And uh, after 23 minutes, uh, they got they got a heartbeat. It was Amazing. a faint heartbeat. My EF or my ejection fraction was, was 10%. And, um, and by the way, normal should be above 50. So 10% yeah. is pretty bad. Yeah, almost dead. I mean, so when, when, when we look at the drama of what actually happened and, and we look at what, what my wife did to get those doctors to go back in and then for them to revive me, um, I just I, I can't be more thankful uh, to her for doing that, to the doctors at, at Providence Hospital in Waco, Texas doing what they did um but that's that's where the story starts well then you were on uh they had to put you on uh, essentially heart lung machine type assistance for a few days right oh yeah yeah i i, I just recently saw a, a picture my business partner from california uh, uh greg amazing business partner while he was at the hospital he actually took a picture and I'm thankful because I'm asking everybody if they have pictures. Nobody took pictures, but there's a there's a photograph of me, on on full life support, feeding tubes, uh, tubes coming out of everywhere you can imagine. I'm surrounded by machines. In fact, they didn't treat me at the hospital I presented at. They had to airlift me over 100 miles away to Austin, and they couldn't take me in a helicopter because there wasn't enough room for me and all the machines. They had to do it in, in an airplane. Yeah, amazing story. Now, after a week or so, you started getting better, but you still had the AFib, right? Yeah, um, I believe that I was in this coma for about nine days. When I woke up, I had no idea where I was at. Um, in fact, didn't really have my bearings about me until about 14, 15 days into it. I was so sedated. But the AFib was still there. Didn't go away. Um, but my ejection fraction was getting a little better. Then what was the advice from your docs? Well, I, I they, they put me on the drugs, and... Uh, <clears throat> I think you were on amiodarone, weren't you? Absolutely. Amiodarone, metoprolol, lisinopril, which is a snake poison, <clears throat> or a snake venom, I should say. Um, yeah, a bunch of stuff. And um, those that know me know that I'm not really a big medicine type of guy. If I can fix it naturally or with vitamins or with food, I would, I would rather do that first. So they're telling me I'm pretty much going to have to stay on these, these drugs. Um, they ultimately told me that my choices were to get the drugs to, to work. If I can get stabilized, they'll try to do a cardio version. <clears throat> and that if that didn't work, which by the way, they did a cardio version, it didn't work. I believe they did it twice. I'd have to check the medical record. But if the cardio version didn't work, then I'd have to see an ele electrophysiologist. And at, and at that point, this, the main grand solution was a catheter ablation. And I'd never heard of it before. So started asking everybody about it and trying to read whatever I could on it in the hospital because I was there for 31 days. In fact, today, June second, June second of two thousand eighteen, I was I was still in the hospital. I'm going to stop here just for a second. If sure. any of our listeners have a question, you can text to DeBakey. That's D E B A K E Y to three seven six zero seven. It wants to join, then text your message. Uh, you can also. Uh, uh, go to poll, P-O-L-E-V dot com forward slash DeBakey. Uh, but you can see on the screen there, text DeBakey on your phone to 37607. Uh, that's the easy way. And if we receive a text from you within the next, uh, say, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I will try to answer your question. 
Uh, Steve, uh, to shorten it just a little bit, did you end up having any catheter ablation? Uh, negative. And tell me, tell our, our listeners your thought process going through this. Okay, so at the time, I'm 43 years old. I have so much depending on me, company, family, friends. Uh, every, my life centers around me. If I go down, it's going to really affect a lot of people. <clears throat> so I wanted to make sure that this was the right path of treatment. So I started to research what is a, an ablation? What is a catheter ablation? And as I started to learn about what it was, what it's trying to do, I became less and less confident that they were actually able to do for me what I wanted, which was to get this problem done with completely. Yeah. <clears throat> That's when I came across your procedure. This was September of, <clears throat> excuse me, September of 2019 is when I discovered uh, you and the procedure uh, that you do. And it lit my eyes up because it does what I was looking for, which was, and I'll let you explain it, but the pulmonary vein isolation, electrical isolation from the pulmonary veins and the top of the heart. That's where the electricity is coming from that's giving me the erratic heartbeat because I was told, I was told that my heart otherwise was per perfect. It was explained like, uh, like the like a house has plumbing and it has electricity. The plumbing is fine. My problem was with the electricity. And so, the Wolf Mini Maze <clears throat> had a, a a cartoon illustration that showed the clamp as it enters the 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 heart. The clamp on the outside of the heart, I should say. Yeah. It goes around and burns a straight line. Well, that's, that's I, I, I got a picture. Maybe if we can switch over to my laptop, which I think we just did. Now you can see this is the clamp in place. This is, I don't know if you can see it or not, Steve. Can you see it? No, sir. Okay. This is the superior vein and the inferior vein and the clamp in place. And this does a complete isolation of the pulmonary veins in, a, in about 10 seconds. Can you see it now, Steve? Uh, no, sir. Okay. I and see for now. This, uh, uh, it's difficult to achieve this from the inside of the heart, but it's relatively easy to achieve this from the outside of the heart. And the other thing that I think is important, which you mentioned in your history, is that you felt that this was brought on by stress. And we call that vagal afib because it's the vagus nerve that has all these little branches around the heart and if you get overstimulation of those branches it can stimulate the heart into atrial fibrillation so the vagus nerve runs in the neck and then it goes down it goes to the stomach it goes to the heart and there are probably a thousand branches around the heart so in particular the little branches around the veins are what give you trouble. And typically with vagal afib, you get sweating, you'll sweat around the back of your neck, and then you'll get palpitations that go into afib. Now ultimately that can go to the point where you're in afib all the time, then you may not get the sweating. But what you described were the typical symptoms of vagal afib. And I think what's important about the Wolf Mini Maze is working with some people in Oklahoma, Sonny Jackman, Ben Sherlock, some researchers, uh, we found, we documented what they found in animals, which are these little nerves on the outside of the heart can be interrupted. In the lab at, in Oklahoma, they interrupted the nerves with alcohol. But we did it in the operating room with a small electrical current, and that stops that input from the vagus nerve. Now the nerves are on the outside of the heart. They're not on the inside of the heart. So it's practically impossible to get to the nerves doing a catheter ablation. But I can test in, in the nerves from the outside. And that's what we started doing with Dr. Jackman from University of Oklahoma. We were the first in the world to test these little nerves on the outside of the heart, ablate those nerves, and show that that blunted the response to AFib. 
So you had vagal AFib, and I think I mentioned to you, well, this might really help you because we can attack the little branches of those nerves that are sort of imbalanced, if you will, unbalanced. And uh, I guess the proof's in the pudding. Uh, you came to Houston to uh, DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center, Houston Methodist Hospital, how long ago? Uh, that would be December of 2019. So uh, about six months ago, right? <clears throat> Getting close, five months ago. Had the procedure. Tell us how it went and tell us how you, what you've done since. Uh, the procedure went great. Uh, I, I, I was I have an incision here and an incision here and a couple of small little portholes. Exactly what I expected. Um, I you, you have a, a video of you doing the entire surgery on on YouTube, and I watched it. I watched that video multiple times, and um, I was very confident going in there. Um, the, the hospital was great, but best thing about it is that all my heart symptoms stopped from that day forward. I had a little, oh, by the I, way, I'd see it up on the screen. If you have a question, you're listening to this. Uh, I want to answer it live, uh, text the Bakey to 37607. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I had a post-surgery, I had a little um, bout with flutter. Yeah. Uh, but I came back and I saw you, and you cardioverted me. Yeah. When you implanted the, the, the link into yep. my chest. Right. And that's another cool feature is that I have this implant in my chest and you can actually take a look at it. Like when you called me last week and you said, Hey, I've been looking at your, at your, at your stuff and eight, zero AFib. Zero AFib. Yeah. The nice thing about the link is that it just goes under the skin. It was a local procedure. We did it in the office. Well, I think we did it at where we, in the hospital, when we did the cardioversion. And That's by correct. the way, you did not have any AFib post-op. You had some flutter, which we see from time to time. And that's usually taken care of with a cardioversion, or it goes away on its own. We did the cardioversion, implanted the link at the same time. So then every month, I can tell Steve what percent of time is his heart out of rhythm. What's your burden? What's your AFib burden? And yours is zero, which is what you want to hear. Also, I can look at it from day to day. So if Steve calls me and says, hey, I felt a little funny today. Could you check uh, the link? I can do that. And it doesn't matter where Steve is. Uh, you're, what, about three hours from here or something like that? Roughly, yep. Um, but you could be, I have some patients all the way in Guam. And we can follow people anywhere in the world. So it's a really nice thing. You don't have to run to the ER. You don't have to run to the doctor's office. I can tell what your AFib burden is. And you have exactly what we want to see. Big zeros, AFib yeah. burden is zero. So another, uh, since then, yeah. do you feel like you're getting your life back? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the peace of mind is there as well too, because yeah. you know when you have AFib, you're mostly worried about a blood clot forming, which would then cause a stroke. Yep. That's the number one fear, really. And I don't have to worry about that. My 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 stroke risk is now. I believe 99% reduced because of the procedure that you did when you closed off the left atrium uh, appendage. Thank you for reminding us to mention that. That's a great point. And you're right. AFib is not just a heart disease. It's a brain disease too, if you have a stroke. That is the most feared complication. That is why people take blood thinners. I imagine you were on blood thinners for a while. Oh, yeah, eloquist. Yeah, but after the mini maze, you don't have to take blood thinners because with the appendage closed, that decreased the risk of stroke by 97%. If you take blood thinners for AFib, you decrease your risk of stroke by about 60%. And you got to take a blood thinner every day or twice a day with eloquist. After the mini maze, no blood thinners and a much increased uh, or much decreased risk of stroke compared to taking blood thinners. So that's a very good point. So you're not on blood thinners now. No. That's great. And how about you feel like you're getting your life back a little bit? Uh, 100%, yeah. Um, 
I started doing push-ups. I started doing some exercise. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm weaker than I was two years ago, but I haven't done anything for, for two years. I've mainly been lying around recuperating. But when I look at what happened and I compare it to what could have happened, I'm extremely happy because I don't even know if I told you this, Dr. Wolf, but um, when I contacted your office, I was trying to get, you know, trying to get approved for the, for the procedure. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was working another angle with my electrophysiologist, mm -hmm. just in case that didn't fall through. I needed a backup plan. I didn't want to go the catheter ablation, but I didn't want to go back down the road of, of the heavy drugs. And you know what? When they gave me the amiodarone in June of 2018, they took me off of it at about the March of 2019 time period because they said, you can't stay on it forever. Yeah. So they took me off of it. And then, as you know, amiodarone stays in your body for about six to eight months. It keeps working after you stop taking it. And when you do the math, about six to eight months is when my symptoms started to come back. And they came back with a vengeance. Yeah. And that's why I said September is, is about that time and it was happening more frequently, more violently. I have, I have one of these, yeah. you know, and so I have everything recorded. Um, I knew I had to do something. So it was either Wolf mini maze, which based on my research was top priority or a catheter mini, a catheter, um, ablation, uh, ablation mm -hmm. rate, rate of frequency ablation. Um, that was plan B. Now I was growing so, uh, I was very doubtful and, and my confidence was just going away um, with the catheter ablation. As I really looked into it, I said, really, they're going to try to do that. They go in through your leg with the tube. They get into your heart. They, they cross over to the other side. The heart's still beating. And they're going to try to burn these little dots so that it makes a perfect line, stops the electricity from flowing. I just didn't think it was going to work. Plus, I read... Uh, you're in one of your cardiothoracic uh, uh, annals of cardiothoracic surgery um, uh, papers that you co-authored with some other doctors talking about how it, the, uh, the origin of that electricity is an autonomic imbalance in the fat pads on the outside of the heart. Right. Starting right. on the outside, how do you fix it from the inside? Just it, it didn't work. It just didn't line up for me. Well, you're right. That's the kind of thinking that led us to do the research and find out that <clears throat> we could, in, in fact, attack these vagal fibers uh, that have gone array, uh, awry. So I think that's a lot better. Unfortunately, with catheter ablation, there's a lot more burning of the muscle, the heart tissue, and I think that's a, a big downside. Yeah. Um, if you would, uh, and this is being recorded so people will watch this, I think the last one we had... 200 people watching it within a day or so. If uh, So I think it's appropriate for me to ask you this question. For someone who has AFib, and, and back up to where you were, where you're trying to decide what to do, you're a relatively young guy, you're in your 40s, you don't want to take amiodarone for 30 years, uh, not a good idea. You're, you're looking at catheter ablation, you looked at the mini maze. <clears throat> what do you, how did you, how, how, how would you recommend someone like you who maybe, uh, maybe isn't as savvy as you on the internet, how should they go about doing their homework? Okay, so the typical path, once you're diagnosed with AFib, whether it be rushed to the ER like me or just on a checkup, regular EKG, the path is always going to try to get you to go from a cardiologist to an electrophysiologist. And I personally feel like once you're with the electrophysiologist, it virtually eliminates the, your chances for a, a surgical ablation. So I like to tell people, just keep it in mind. If it, it's, it's an option. There's some people who are afraid of surgery. You know, let's, let's all be honest here. Getting cut open, you know, it's... It's not like you leave the hospital and then you start running and run right back to life. There's definitely a recovery period, yeah. but, uh, but it's definitely bearable. Um, but I would, I would say go to wolfminimaze.com. That's the website. 
where it sort of started for me. And then I, I went to Google. Well, first I went to YouTube and I just typed in Dr. Randall Wolf and I watched everything that you have out there. All right. I watched the debate that you had with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, was it, uh, Valderabino, I think yeah. was his name. Yeah, yeah. Amazing guy, just a, an incredible electrophysiologist. Um, but that was also one of the things that were a tipping point for me. It really talks about catheter ablation versus the surgical option. Both both cases are explained. I would say watch that. And then if they are interested in the more academic literature, just to just check the annals of uh, cardiothoracic surgery and uh, type in Dr. Randall Wolf and just kind of geek out on that kind of stuff. I think that's good advice. And uh, uh, I do uh, recommend that patients see an electrophysiologist and see someone like me, get opinions from everybody. Uh, sometimes patients call and they say, well, Dr. Wolf, I've, I've got an electrophysiologist and um, I don't want them to get upset with me if they find out that I called you. And I said, really, the only physician you should be worried about is the one that doesn't want you to get a second opinion. So I think second opinions are good. Third opinions are good. Yeah. And if you have a chronic disease uh, like AFib, you have time to do your homework. It's not like an appendicitis. Appendicitis, you don't have time to do a couple of weeks of uh, online searching. You got to get to an ER and get help. Uh, but for chronic diseases, you have time to do your research, see a couple different people, and then weigh the, the risk and the advantages. Uh, 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 one of our patients from California, uh, Ross, uh, did a, uh, a diagram of the of four quadrants, do nothing, do a catheter ablation, do medication, do the mini maze. Now he ultimately, and this is on my website I think, he ultimately uh, opted for the mini maze. He's a pilot, he flies planes, and he's also a skydiver, and he's on the Wolf Mini Maze site. And he wanted a more permanent solution. He wanted a solution that didn't involve blood thinners too also a relatively fit guy. Uh, so he did his, everything has, a, has an advantage, everything has a risk. And he looked at that and he decided the mini maze had the most advantages with the least amount of risk. So that's another way to look at it. Yeah, in sales we used to call that the old Ben Franklin. The old um, what? We, we used to call that sales technique when I was, when I was in sales, we called it the Ben Franklin technique where you, you, you list the pros and the cons. Yeah. You count them, whoever wins, that's the, that's the right decision. Yeah. And there are pros and cons for every approach. I think yeah. they're, they're big cons. Now, the other thing that we do sometimes, someone, uh, someone uh, might come to me who's very old, maybe 80, 85. They've been in AFib for 30 years. So, the chances of the Wolf Mini Maze stopping their AFib are not good because they've been in it so long. And I mean continuous, not just in and out. But they can't take blood thinners. They have a risk of falling or they've already fallen. I've seen some patients have already been to a neurosurgeon with a bleed into their head. They cannot take blood thinners. For those patients, we just go in on the left side only. You had it on both sides and we treated the nerves and we did the ablation. For some people, we just want to get them off blood thinners and dramatically decrease their risk of stroke. So we just go in on the left side and we put that clip on the appendage. You put the clip on the appendage, immediately their stroke risk from AFib has gone from significant to almost zero. So that's another nice procedure that we offer for people who maybe can't get back in rhythm, but they still want to get off blood thinners. Uh, I've operated on patients that uh, mainly uh, live outside the United States. They're very concerned about their care. And as you sort of mentioned earlier, it's like you got this time bomb. You never know when it's going to go off. And you want to be free of that. Uh, he wanted to have the appendage closed and the mini maze because it may not be easy for him to get back to the U.S. Uh, so there are lots of different scenarios that people have. Uh, 
And it is true that uh, many times there are patients like you who have not already had a catheter ablation. We do see a lot of patients that have had two, three, four, even five catheter ablations. Uh, but uh, some patients now are saying, well, let me really do my homework and see which way I want to go. And they decide to go just with the mini maze and not wait until they've failed two or three catheter ablations. It is true that if, the, if there's a failed catheter ablation, we can still help those people with the mini maze. It's also true, and the mini maze isn't 100%. In some patients, they may still have AFib after the mini maze. And we can then go back with a catheter and find some spots that may be places we can't get to with the mini maze. And that's also been very successful. In the latest article on that, they had 26 patients who had a mini maze first and then still had some AFib. And 24 out of the 26 were AFib free with a follow-up catheter ablation. Uh, we don't do very many of those. It's probably just a couple a year, but it's still another option. There still is another option there. We've never had to redo a mini maze. In other words, reoperate on a patient. It's a one-time deal. So uh, what are you up to now? Give us, a, give us an update to where you are now. You, you look pretty healthy and you look pretty happy. Uh, met your lovely wife and thank God for her. She wouldn't let the doctors give up on you. Um, you're, uh, are you in Waco? Yes, sir. Yep. And you've got some, you're back at work doing stuff. You're... Yeah, yeah. I recently, probably about a month ago, I started to push myself physically. I helped my brother-in-law and my sister move, you know, lifting boxes, not, not crazy, not heavy stuff. Cause you know, when you let me out of the hospital, you told me to keep it at about 15 pounds, not to really exert. I think one of the nurses said, um, like a gallon of milk or lighter or something like that. I forget well, what yeah, it's, they <laughs> do that mainly for the open hearts. You really, you really didn't have to do that, but I think you were very deconditioned. I mean, you, yeah. you'd be, you'd had this going on for some time. Oh um, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. Very I deconditioned. Just, you were, I mean, you were in, they say if you're in bed for a couple of days, it takes about six weeks to get back to normal. You were in bed and in a coma for nine days. Yeah. It takes a long time to get, get back from that. No, all, then, I, all I did is I didn't tell that to your wife. I, all I told her was you couldn't wash the dishes and you couldn't <laughs> sweep the floor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just another benefit. So, but I will tell you, I, uh, I, I, saw, I saw one of your videos um, where at the end of the video, you did a magic trick. And so I remember when I was visiting you for the first time, we brought that up and my wife asked, Dr. Wolf, could you, could you do a magic trick? And uh, you, you looked around and you said, yeah, let me do one real quick. And you pulled out your wallet and you got some cards out and did a magic trick for us. We thought that was really cool. Yeah. Well, I am a professional magician, yep. and I'm a member of the Academy of Magical Arts, the headquarters being the Magic Castle in uh, Hollywood, uh, California, on uh, Franklin Avenue. So yep. I do keep that up. But for now, I'm still going to keep my day job for a little <laughs> while longer. All right. It's, uh, it's really been great to talk to you, and I, I thank you for really a public service and getting the word out there. I thought you had a very unusual AFib case, uh, but uh, thank goodness for a lot of people that helped pull you through all this. I'm glad to be a part of that. And cool. I think people will appreciate you taking your time to explain uh, uh, your, your, uh, your search for a cure for AFib. If anybody wants to contact you, are, are they allowed to or not? Oh yeah, absolutely. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Do you have a uh, email or something, or a way they can get a hold of you? Yep, I will. I will get it right here. It'll be reformnow at gmail dot com. That's r e f o r m n o w at gmail dot com. Reformnow at gmail dot com. So they can send you a message. Well, uh, our time's about up. Uh, thank you for taking some time out of your day. Tell your lovely wife I said hi. And uh, stay tuned for more from uh, DeBakey.
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. All right. Stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Bakey live from Houston Methodist uh, right here deep in the heart of Texas.